Gary uh, Linkoff doesn't need any more introduction. How many people were here uh, last night, uh, yesterday, for his talk, huh? Are we, are we all impressed? Well, you know, I, I had a, a, a cancellation, and I, so I asked Gary if he'd do a third talk. Uh, you know, normally we try to keep him in the, in, the, um, in, in the area of the keynote and other things where he isn't talking about things that are going to get him in trouble. But I think he's willing to take that risk. As, he's, as I'm willing to, uh, to testify, as he testified, and as Andy Weil has testified, and as Paul Stamets has testified, that having ingested uh, psychotropic uh, mushrooms has been a part of our development as people and has helped us to get to the place we are. And I hope that uh, all of you take care and take a look out at Bill um, um, Patterson's uh, uh, little table outside. There's some warnings about taking um, uh, psychoactive uh, substances. Uh, you know, set and setting is always very important. It's not a recreational experience. It's really meant to be done in a sacred way. And I think you're going to hear in the panel tonight some of the opportunities for understanding the whole uh, way of, of using some of these very powerful medicinal and, and uh, therapeutic uh, substances. But it's not something you take lightly. I know some people were talking about Datura. And uh, I come from California originally. My family was there for seven generations. Uh, my, my family goes back to the 1790s in the Monterey area, and uh, my ancestors. And the Tura grows everywhere there. It was called Toloake, and was used by the traditional people as their kind of spirit guide. But you know what? It's a very dangerous plant. You die if you take the wrong preparation. Many of these things take preparations. Even Amanita muscaria, I've talked to some people who say they use it and they have a way of preparing it or the way they, in order to use it, that it doesn't create the kind of delirium effect that Andy always talked about. All right, I, as people are coming in, it's a little bit noisy, but I, I really am going to let Gary uh, kind of get up here and uh, start talking. So please, another welcome for Gary Linkoff, our featured Michael man. the drum a little bit. Needs a little warming. It has a great sound when it's warmer. Okay, welcome. We can talk about magic mushrooms. Ever hear of them? So before I do, I'd like to ask, uh, how many of you um, heard Katrina this morning? It was a fantastic program on edible wild plants here in this area. And she had all kinds of specimens that she was passing around demonstrating. Uh, we took a walk around town. There were at least a dozen different greens that we were passing that she, all, she had talked about. And they're right there on the streets. So if you take a walk with her afterwards, if you go up Bear Creek, you'll see a lot of the plants that are edible, a lot of berries, a lot of greens, a lot of seeds. So you should try to avail yourself of that opportunity, okay? Um, one story in connection with that. Um, our mushroom guru, the person we learned from, was um, named Scott Nearing. Uh, no. Actually, um, it was Scott Neering's brother. All right. There were these two brothers, and they grew up in Pennsylvania, in coal country. And they were the um, grandchildren of a coal mine owner. And they both sort of rebelled against their upbringing because they lived in a, um, a company town, the kind of place where everyone who worked in the mine had to buy everything from the mine. So what they got paid, they paid back for their food, their clothing, and so on. And so 
Guy Neering and Scott Neering rebelled out of that lifestyle and went off in different directions. Scott became a world famous communist in the early 20s, the kind of person who would be fired from every university he tried to teach in, and finally gave up and decided he was gonna live the good life and go out into the wild and find out how difficult it really was to live as simply as possible. And he was amazingly successful and he lived in, I think, to about 99. And he wrote a lot of books, some of you know, Living the Good Life, I hope. Um, he lived a very simple life, but he was, being a communist, believed that you should only benefit from your own work and never take anyone else's, and including the weeds in his garden. So he was a weeder. He pulled everything out of his garden that wasn't intended to be there and threw it away. His brother Guy, who is my mushroom guru, also was a gardener. He believed in the weeds. And he thought that the best things he grew in his garden were the weeds that weren't intended to be there and thought that his diet was best provided by all the weeds he picked out of his garden and ate. The two brothers didn't talk for the last 50 years of their lives because they had a, um, I guess, a basic misunderstanding. But they both lived into their late 90s. And we learned a lot about edible wild plants as well as mushrooms from gynearing. So, now with that, I'm going to talk now about magic mushrooms. That's a, um, there is no picture up on the screen, is that right? Oh, no. I don't know if your slideshow's on there. Oh, oh, okay. Lower left corner. Yeah, okay. Uh-huh. Okay, well, there are five mushrooms in this picture. Can you find them? <laughs> This is the first year I didn't bring slides um, to tell your ride in 30 years, the first time. And I was going to bring them as backup. And um, my wife, Irene, said, no, you're not. It's, it's time to grow up. <laughs> Leave them home. Technology can work. <laughs> Just don't trust it too far. Okay. So, a number of things that might interest you, we're going to talk about here um, about these 
these strange mushrooms. And we're going to talk about two basic groups, one of them being the psilocybes, uh, the ones that contain psilocybin. You heard Paul's talk on those mushrooms. And the other is probably the most conspicuous photogenic uh, mushroom that's out here this year, the fly agaric Amanita muscaria. Uh, they are very different kinds of mushrooms. They are both used shamanically. Uh, they're both used um, both for recreation and as medicinals and as spiritual healers in different places, the psilocybes in Mexico and the fly agaric, the mucamor um, in, um, in, in, in Russia, in the Russian Far East. We were in Kamchatka a couple of times. We met this particular woman, Tatiana, who was a shaman, a seventh generation shaman. And among other things, I am going to be putting on sale later, if you're interested, there is a 25 or 30 minute documentary called Song of Mukamore that was made by Tom Stimson about a trip that we took in 1995 to visit these people. We visited maybe a dozen different, more than a dozen different villages in Kamchatka to interview the local people to find out did they use Amanita muscaria? If they did, how did they use it? How did they collect it? How did they eat it? Who ate it? Um, what was the experiences that they had? And it was an amazing, we did this twice. Um, it was an amazing set of trips because we, we found all different kinds of responses to our questions. Um, but we found a, a, a marvelous openness in terms of their willingness to talk to us about, because who were we after all? Just, we just came down out of the sky in a helicopter and we're, we're a motley crew of people who don't speak any language they've ever heard before, um, wandering into their villages, <laughs> interested in this mushroom that obviously no one had taken an interest in outside of their area, probably forever. So, um, and this is a, um, a video of that, and Tom is selling this for $25. I have five of these here, and if these sell out, um, I'll bring a poster tonight with Tom's info on it so that you can, um, you can, can contact him directly if you'd like this. I think this is a, um, a wonderful little video uh, I have seen it multiple times because it's, it's a, you get into the experience of the use of a mushroom rather than just hearing information about it. And part of what Magic Mushrooms is all about is not just information, it's not just knowledge that you learn something, but that you, you do something with it. You make it real, you make it part of your life. And so we're gonna talk about how do you go about doing these things, if, especially if you've never eaten, say, anything other than an edible mushroom? How or why would you want to do something like this? So, if you saw Paul's talk, he did show this magazine, and this was, the, in a way, the beginning of an American consciousness about psychedelic mushrooms. And this was in 1957. And this is a collector's item. However, it's like any other Life magazine that came out in that entire, all those years. Um, the only difference being that this one had this article about psychedelic mushrooms. Because the issue is all about just cars and refrigerators and, and how to do things quickly so that you don't have to use up your precious time um, so that you can get as much of your work day as possible and you can be a good workaholic American. So, and here was a, an article in Life Magazine that said, just let it go. <laughs> and you know, some people did and more and more have since then. Anyway, I'm not gonna stay with these because you saw these that, that Paul showed you and it's just extraordinary that they allowed this to be published 
and that now we take this as for granted. Oh, yeah, uh, magic mushrooms in a magazine. Well, we've seen these thousands of times in other kinds of publications, but Life Magazine? What was the spirit that got through the editor that allowed this to happen? Maybe the editor had been taking the mushrooms. So, and this is a book that I have been reading because I've been looking for a manual, a way of, of directing people to use magic mushrooms rather than just scarfing them down and seeing what happens, uh, which is the way we usually do things. And this is a, um, it's a fascinating read. It's a very short book. It's available on Amazon. In fact, just about anything you want out there is actually free on the internet. Um, I think if Arrowwood doesn't have it, you can just Google the psychedelic experience and you'll see that someone has it out there because they've scanned it. And you can read these things for nothing. But what's nice about having the actual book in your hand is, is that, you know, it's just like having a field guide. You feel, or a Bible, you feel somehow protected because you're holding it. Whereas if it's on the internet, if it's out there somewhere in the World Wide Web, you can't quite touch it. And it could disappear at any second. And, you know, and where'd it go? And then you get really anxious and the whole thing just sort of crumbles. So you want to have this really good experience so you get a copy of this book. And what's nice about a book is, is that you have lots, and this has lots of white space so that you can write all kinds of notes in. And I like to write notes in margins. So I'll have important notes like, what is a high dose of psilocybe cubensis? Oh, the wet, oh, 50 grams wet. Hmm, do you agree with that? How about psilocybe cyanescens? 30 grams wet, that's two to 14 small mushrooms. I mean, it's, if you don't have a gram scale, or if you don't know how to translate milligrams into grams, it's really hard to know what dose you're taking. Most of us don't go there. We count mushrooms. So that if you're in Tillamook, Oregon, and you um, happen to notice that there's a pasture and that people are bent over picking something, and it turns out that that's Psilocybe semilanciata, and Paul said that was his favorite psychedelic mushroom, how many would you eat? Well, I was rooming with a guy who ate seven, as I did, but then 15 minutes later he got anxious and nothing was happening, so he took another seven, and then 15 minutes later still nothing had happened, so he took another seven, and I was still on my first seven, and things were just starting to click in, and he was gone. <laughs> he was so gone that um, he walked, he was wandering around in this place in Oregon we were, and um, people were offering him other things, and he was taking whatever was handed to him. And then I ended up, um, I was rooming with him, and um, he said, um, I think I'm going to bed. I said, that's really a good idea. And he got into his sleeping bag. There was a bed there, but he got into the sleeping bag, and... Um, he said, can you see my feet? I said, uh, no, um, you're in the sleeping bag. I can see your head. He said, you can see my feet, can't you? I said, no, I really can't. Uh, he said, you're lying. I said, no, honest, I, um, I'll bring other people in and they'll, they'll assure you that no one can see your feet. Then he got down into the sleeping bag so you couldn't see any of him at all. And we had to convince him to at least come out to breathe and um, I had four people with me all night, and we were just trying to um, sort of stay with this person and sort of bring him around. He had never taken drugs before. He was so, not, he was so drug naive, and he had no idea what the onset meant or how long before the onset of symptoms. 
So he was sort of not the best person to room with at that conference. And he pretty much ruined everyone else's experience. Um, but he hasn't taken any since then, so, um, which is fine for the rest of us. Um, okay, so um, there are people who really um, aren't ready for this. There was a gym teacher who was a, a mushroom teacher also, and she was a, a very stern person who had a very rigid personality, and she took mushrooms at this conference, and I didn't think anyone that old took mushrooms. Um, she was an elderly person, and, um, well, I was 30 years younger. Than her. And, um, and, and, and she was um, getting more and more depressed. And I, um, I asked her, I said, well, what's the matter? And she said, well, nothing's happening. She said, I don't know what's wrong with me. And I said, well, nothing's wrong with you. She said, oh, yes, look at them out, all the, out, out there. They're all having such a good time. And I'm here, and I've taken the mushroom, and nothing's happening. And I'm depressed, and I'm miserable. And you had to jolly her out of this horrible down state because she felt incapable of having an experience. And she was so looking forward to it. On the other hand, we have had people come here to tell you ride like this retired couple that came up from Florida and they were in their 70s and this woman comes over and she sidles over to me and she said I've heard you know where the mushrooms are I said yeah and I said they're on the display table over here she said not those mushrooms and she um she said, my husband and I are retired teachers from Florida. We came here because we heard about the Telluride Mushroom Festival. We don't want any of our friends back in Florida to know that we're here, but we are here, and we're here to take the mushroom. And I said, you mean your, your trip will be a, a, a failure if you don't experience this mushroom? And she said, well, we're really looking forward to it. And I'm looking at these two sort of ancient looking people and thinking, is this a really good idea? Because we took um, Chuck Barrows on the Amazon and we gave him ayahuasca when he was over 80. And I didn't understand what the vine of the dead, the common name for ayahuasca meant until Chuck took the ayahuasca. And he said, I'm dying. And we needed, Manny and Joanne were on that trip and Manny's a doctor, and he had to assure Chuck that he had a very good pulse and that there were no indications to him at all that Chuck was dying. And Chuck was assured, uh, absolutely convinced he was. And, and he almost looked dead. And, um, and Joanne played nurse and um, with a doctor and a nurse on either side of them saying, you're okay, Chuck, you're gonna come around, it's okay. Um, and of course, the next morning, he was fine and didn't have any memory of what he put us through. <laughs> anyway, this, this couple, we, um, we set something up. And at, in those years, we were using magic mushrooms in um, ice cream. And we had ice cream like milkshakes and ice cream mixes and things. And you would, because they really don't taste very good, you sit there chewing on these things. Gordon Wasson described this in that Life Magazine article. You eat 13 pairs of mu 26 mushrooms and one is bad enough and you're chewing more and more and, you, and they're looking at, keep going. Um, but we put them in ice, we were putting them in ice cream and so you all tasted just nice things like chocolate ice cream. And anyway, um, her husband was sitting in a chair and he started tilting. And he was tilting sort of like the leaning tower of Pisa. And fortunately there was a wall about a foot away and he sort of leaned into it. And we were watching to see, was he going to just fall? No, he just stayed there, rock hard against that wall um, for a couple of hours. And she was curled up on a sofa in another room looking beatific. And afterwards, 
Um, they said it was one of the best experiences of their lives. And I asked the husband, I said, well, what was going on while you were on the mushroom? And he said, I can't even begin to tell you. And so these people were going back to Florida to their friends and they had something they experienced that they couldn't even communicate to us, let alone to how they would talk to their friends about it, which of course they wouldn't. Anyway, okay, so, so this is a manual and it's based on the Tibetan Book of the Dead. And you'd say, well, what does that have to do with a mushroom that is used shaman shamanically in Mexico? I mean, it's like a totally different tradition. What can you get out of it? And what um, Tim Leary and Ralph Metzner and Richard Alpert, Baba Ramdas did was they envisioned a way of using that extraordinary document, reducing it to essentially a schematic manual of how to go about using psychedelic drugs, including mushrooms. And one of the things that's important that they talk about, of course, which many of you know, is set and setting. That you are not supposed to just um, be rushing through your life and then just say, oh, gee, it's five o'clock, it's time for magic mushrooms. And you <laughs> scarf them down and you say, but you know, I really have something to do at eight o'clock. Is this gonna like interfere? Is it okay? Um, can I just like, like, it's like a coffee or a, a a beer, um, and what they try to tell you, and things that you already know, most of you, is, is that you need ideally three days to do these mushrooms. You need a day of preparation, a day of quieting down your system, like not watching the Colorado Rockies, um, not reading the newspaper, not reading about Pakistan, um, not even drying your mushrooms, unless you're doing it as a Zen experience, but the idea of just being quiet and being prepared for this event. And then you have the day of the event itself in which you eat relatively little, not like many of us are doing, you know, eating every mushroom that we can cook up and we're gonna have a full stomach. And then if you eat some of these magic mushrooms and you become a little nauseous, you're gonna blame the magic mushroom and not all the food that's in your stomach, which is causing that, okay? And then you need a day to recover. And this is something that most of us, we don't have time for this anymore in our society because we, we have to like pencil it in. It has to be in the calendar. And how do we do that? Because we gotta go somewhere else. And how do you just have a day where you just like let the whole thing come together so that you're not rushing off to another experience, but that you honor the experience you're having. So this is one of the things that they bring out in this book that many of you who are um, used to taking LSD or taking a variety of different drugs, you already know things like this, but some of you don't. So when you saw that movie, Know Your Mushrooms, or you saw that little clip on YouTube, which when I saw it, I couldn't believe I had said all that <laughs> here in Telluride because I thought that was just a run through to see what I looked like on film. I didn't know that they were seriously interested in using it. Um, anyway, what, what I learned of, I was so naive when I went into that guy's house um, that I was astonished you know, by everything of, around me and the set and the setting were the worst in the world because I really didn't want to take those mushrooms because I had a flight the next morning and it was like, and the environment was totally wrong because he had all those guns on his wall and he had, and the dogs were barking outside and this was, this was LA for God's sake. And like, what are you doing there in the first place? And why are you with these guys? And um, and if you saw the movie, you know, I mean, they met me in, the, in a canyon and they, um, they were looking for me. I mean, what are the chances of someone looking for you in a place you happen to be? And, and, and then they, um, and they wanted me to help them leave the planet. And, you know, <laughs> it was 
It was intriguing. I mean, like, no one else has ever asked me to help them leave the planet. And so I was impressed, you know? And, um, and, and, and then here's this guy who I don't think really knows anything except drugs and how to fill a refrigerator full of them. But we're sitting there, and if you heard that little shtick, you know, the guy turns into a wolf and all that. Um, but he was a guide, and I didn't appreciate that because I was tense, and I was sitting there with my, he, he, he recognized that my hands were clenched, and he said, well, when are you going to let your hands open? I said, why? Is that important? And he said, well, he thought it would be really good if I could just unclench my hand and let my fingers just, like, be loose, and I did. And um, after I really relaxed, he said, do you notice anything coming out of your fingers? And I looked, and I, I saw this light coming out. And um, he said, and he asked me what color it was, and it was something like, suddenly, I was seeing a light, and that the light had a color. And he said, and what are you going to do? Because the light looked like it was going up through the ceiling. And he said, do you want to follow it? And I guess I'm very suggestible. Um, <laughs> But it was sort of like an escape in a way because why did I want to spend time in a room with a person who had turned into a wolf, who had guns on his walls, where the dogs were barking outside, where I knew this was going to be the last day of my life. I didn't want to spend it like that. So here was a, a way out. You could just follow that light. And that the roof opened. And it, he led me through that. I could never have done that on my own. I would have been so scattered in that house. I would have been banging off the walls, metaphorically, because I would have seen the guns, and I would have seen the wolf, then I would have seen all kinds of probably um, horrible images. But instead, he got me out of there. And he essentially, I mean, he could have devoured me while I was sitting there. I mean, I could have come back from my trip and found my head gone. But, but you know, there I was, you know, just as I had left myself. And I, I trusted him, even though I probably shouldn't have, but he was a guide. And it's something that you should think of when you are, if you're interested in doing something like this. And you probably also should have a control. That is, someone who either has not been taking the mushroom or someone who is taking a lower dose so that you have someone just, it's not because you need that person, but because there's a security blanket feeling to having someone around. And then something else that you discover when you read about taking these compounds is it's really not a good idea to take them by a railroad track <laughs> because you, get, you really believe that you can somehow stand on that track and hold your hands out and the train will stop um, it's just too much Superman on TV. Uh, you, don't, you don't go up to the top of a building to um, take these mushrooms so that you can look over because you're going to have that belief that you can fly. And while I do believe anything is possible, I won't sit on the top of a building under the influence of magic mushrooms. I like to be on the ground and preferably outside but if it's going to be inside, then you want the conditions to be right. You want it to be beautiful. You want maybe some nice music that you like to hear. And you want to be with people that you like to be with. Because if you bond with people you don't like, it's, it's your life. <laughs> and you end up with these people that you can't shake ever. And, um, and you wish you could. And... Sometimes you just never understand it. So uh, anyway, so these are, these are some of the things that you can get from a simple little manual like this. And it's not necessary that you follow this manual, but that it has so many good ideas. One of them being, by the way, that you read the manual before you take the mushrooms. Uh, and he mentions this in every chapter. He said, don't pick this up afterwards and find out why you screwed up. Um, find out now. 
because what he was trying to tell you in this, which when I first started taking mushrooms, I didn't know, is, is that there are all these traps out there. You start seeing things, and you assume that those things are indicators that you should then follow. And so when you are taking these mushrooms, you have to ask yourself, what is the goal that you have in mind? You may not have any goal in mind. You may just have, I just want to get high. And that's a goal. Fine, that's a recreational use of psychedelics. And that's tri primarily what most of us do. It's instead of going to a bar and drinking some beer or drinking a bottle of wine, we say, oh, we're going to do mushrooms. And you do mu it's an alternative. Well, that's one way. But there are other ways. Some are good and some are not so good. The not so good are the people who are doing mushrooms with you who have another agenda. And you don't know it until you're on the mushroom unless you are really perceptive. And so you don't necessarily do this with strangers. Although by now, I don't think anyone here in this auditorium is a stranger anymore. We have been here together for three days. So in a sense, we are family. And I do trust you. But if you are doing this back home, and you are doing this with people you really don't know, they can be setting traps for you that you aren't aware of that have to do when you are seeing um, unbelievably voluptuous images out there. And it's very sexually oriented. And you just know this is the time and this is the place. And I don't know if that's the right person, but who cares? And the next morning, you care. <laughs> I don't believe I did that. So that was a trap. And you have to be able to recognize that and with and stand back a little bit and just say, maybe not now, maybe not with this person or these people or, oh my God, how many hands and arms are there out there? Um, so there are different, and there are different people who are on ego trips and you don't really know who they are necessarily and they are on power trips and you wanna be just with people who are just like you and so this is one of the things we can do here in Telluride, is you talk to people, you, you, you network with them, you see what are their interests, what are their interests in the world besides getting high, and what sorts of things are they, are they, do they want to achieve? So if your goal, for example, is changing the world or saving the world, like Paul says, there are lots of like-minded people out there that are just right for you, to take the mushroom with because then you can use that experience to energize yourself to do lots of things out there that you might not otherwise have the incentive to do. And the mushroom can give you that if you are not interested in changing the world, but you are interested, let's say, in transcendence. What you want is self-discovery. You want to get, you want to have an out-of-body experience. You don't necessarily want to take mushrooms with someone who is focused on something totally different. You want to take those mushrooms with people who are transcendently oriented so that you can all have a mystical experience. It's, a mystical experience is not for everyone. It's not, the, it's not an easygoing Saturday night party thing. You are spun out of your body, and you are out there, and you are experiencing something you have never experienced before. If you see light as particles, or if you see this hand as particles, components, cells, that's okay. But you can also see light as a wave, and you can see this hand as actually there but made up of five gazillion different elements, including all the space around it. And then you're not seeing bodies at all. You're seeing through the bodies. You're seeing all the elements, and you are becoming one with them. And this is definitely not something 
that you would think a banker like R. Gordon Wasson would be comfortable with or that you would be comfortable trusting him with your money. <laughs> so, this is 1977, and this is Tampa, Florida, and that is Steve Pollack, and he was the, the guy that got me out of a, um, a suit and tie event where there were 1,200 mycologists all either talking about fungi or looking for jobs so they could talk about fungi, and none of them knew the mushrooms that were growing outside the building in Tampa where we were, except for five who recognized that it was the green sport lepiota. And all the other people I asked said things like, oh, I'm a medical mycologist. I only work with skin diseases. Or um, I'm a, I'm a, um, a, uh, I work with water molds. I said, but it's the biggest thing on campus. It's these huge mushrooms. What are they? And no one knew, except for Alexander Smith and some of his cronies who were at that foray, at that conference. So here was Steve Pollack, and he was in a um, multicolored minivan out in the parking lot, um, dressed like this, and bearded. And he said, why don't you come out, and um, let's go look for some mushrooms. And um, I said, yeah, I'd like to go look for some mushrooms. And he said, well, bring your badge with you, because we can use it. And I had a badge for the conference. And he said, um, OK, let's go see what's in the pastures. So we started driving around. and. Um, there were these mushrooms coming up in the pastures. And, he, and you see this barbed wire fence. And um, he said, well, let's go up and ask the, the farmer if we can go into his pasture, which we did. And I flashed my badge. And the um, farmer said, oh, yeah, you're studying mushrooms over at the university? Sure, go into the pasture. So we went in, and naturally, um, all the mushrooms in the pasture were psilocybes. And they were lots of psilocybe cubensis. And after you pick 40 or 50 of them, um, you got enough, you know. It only takes two. So, and I, I'm on my knees, um, like looking at these mushrooms and photographing them. And I hear something behind me, and I turn around, and there are like 500 cows that are like right behind me. And I'm thinking, are they male or female? Not a good position to be in. So I, um, I said, well, uh, Steve, um, how do you get them to go back the other way? He said, just ignore them. They're not there. Take them out of your sight. So we kept walking around looking for things. And see if I have. Yeah, so this is what we were seeing from a distance. And this is our Psilocybe cubensis, which is the most common mushroom that you see, large mushroom coming up in pastures. And they had these articles in High Times and whatnot about stalking the magic mushroom. But let me see if I have, oh, and then you saw, I'm sorry, if I show some of these things you've seen before. But this is um, in Thailand, we were finding the same mushroom on elephant dung. Um, if you're riding elephants, you don't get down when you see mushrooms. You just indicate to the people on the ground, there's one, and they pick it for you, which is really cool. Um, it's a kind of mushroom hunting we haven't tried here in Telluride. <laughs> anyway, this is the same Psilocybe cubensis uh, in Thailand that we get here in the States. And then there was another mushroom, blue staining, that they were selling in the markets of Chiang Mai. Um, market mushrooms selling? Magic mushrooms in the marketplace? Yeah, it's Thailand. <laughs> All right, so um, let me just go back to this. So anyway, so we, um, we were finding these other things, and a number of things we found we didn't know. And, and um, uh, Steve said, uh, I'm going to take them back and, and um, tissue culture them and see if I can get them to grow. And so, yeah, that's a good idea. So he had a little setup in his van that he could do all this because he was, he was an MD and he was a, um, a determined um, explorer of, of mushrooms, especially psilocybes. And you saw in Paul's talk that you saw pictures of Steve on some of the trips he took with, um, with Paul and with, um, I don't know, there were four or five other people in that picture and they went all up through the Northwest checking out the psilocybes. 
Well, here was Steve, and he was finding this really neat thing. We didn't know what it was. And he grew it out, and it turned out to be the mushroom that we know now as Psilocybe tampanensis, the Tampa mushroom. And it is not only blue staining, but it's something that produces a large tuber-like sclerotium. And Steve eventually got published and officially. And what was really neat about it was that you could grow this mushroom and you didn't have to produce the fruiting body. You could work on just developing a larger and larger sclerotium or tuber. So Steve would come to these events, including one we had in Gothic in 1980, and he had something the size of the Hope Diamond. And he was calling it the Rock of Ages. And he was slicing a little piece. He, would you like a slice? And everyone was sort of taking slices of this um, rock that he was holding that was just this compressed mycelium that if you took it in Gothic in 1980, within 30 minutes, you could either flash forward thousands of years or back in time, or you could be in another galaxy. And it was really neat. And this uh, made the rounds for a number of years. People were growing it and spreading it around. Uh, it was popular in New York for a while. The only downside of the whole thing, one guy said was, um, he said, it's a little gassy. I said, I think you can deal with that. But he was one of those people who believed that, um, that you can use the mushroom to energize all the different power points in your body. And so he was, he was very interested in how to connect the mushroom with what's going on inside you that we're usually not aware of. Like where are our, where are our strengths, where are the weaknesses in our body, and how can we focus on them under the influence of, say, a mushroom like that. So with going back to Oaxaca for a minute, these are not used in Mexico, and the Amanita muscaria is not usually used in eastern Russia um, as a party drug. They are primarily used as healing drugs. And so the shaman, sometimes taking it by herself or sharing it with someone, uh, will be trying to find out something and like diagnosing what is wrong with you? Because you're not going to her saying, I'm a perfectly happy, healthy, well-adjusted human being, and I just want to get high. No, you have to go, and I think Watson did this also, you have to go with a problem. And some, I, I guess sometimes they just sort of made up what the problem was. But the idea was you had something either physically wrong with you, something in your mind that bothered you, something you couldn't, that you had lost, that you needed to find, that you wanted to reconnect with a dead relative. And she was able to use the mushroom with the incense and give you the, the feeling that, indeed, you could do these things, which is quite a powerful drug in itself. And so here's this, this person who is under the influence, or you were with her under the influence, seeing things, not necessarily enjoying what you're seeing, because you can see these, these people can go through uh, a variety of different um, uh, syndromes that are quite painful. So it's, it's not all laughing, as you might have seen in that movie in Know Your Mushrooms. You saw those scientists, that guy said, the first effect is laughing. And you see this guy laughing his head off, and the brujo, or the shaman, looking um, very disapprovingly at him for looking like a silly child. But that is the early sort of stage of that experience. And of course, it's a question also of how much they are taking. And in Mexico, those are very high doses. Most of us take much smaller doses. Anyway, to just follow through, there is this, um, and I'll get, I'll get back to the philosophies. Tatiana was a woman we met in eastern Russia, in Kamchatka. We had read Gordon Wasson's book, and Wasson was unable to go there because at that time, the Soviet Union, Soviet Union was there, 
and there were no permits to go into Kamchatka because it was a restricted area. Petropavlovsk was a nuclear subport, and you had to go in there to get up country, and so you were, it was forbidden. Once the government fell, everything was open. And so we set up two trips, one in 94, one in 95, and we went up country by helicopter to do the very things that Gordon Wasson wanted to do but couldn't because of the law at that time. And so we, we met people, and this was the most extraordinary person we met, who didn't trust us at all for the first couple of days. She was sure we were just drug crazy, and we just wanted to um, learn her secrets so we could just get high. And it took a while before we broke down her resistance that she trusted us. I mean, she, lo she listened to us. She understood that we were total idiots. We didn't understand anything. We were clearly not drug-oriented because we were picking all these mushrooms that were not drug mushrooms. They were just mushrooms. And that we were talking like we knew what we were talking about. We used all kinds of Latin and we talked about how this is different from that. And she said, oh, they must be real. And she opened up to us and she started telling us about how the mushroom is used. And we have all these tapes and some of that is on the um, Song of Mukamore. But there, um, Tom is also developing a two hour version of the trip which has much more extensive footage, which is a very good documentary once he gets some titles into it, um, which will be available soon. So that you can see this, so that you, in a way you can experience what we experienced when we were there. And so Tatiana, while she looks like something on the Ed Sullivan show, that was a TV show back in the 60s. Yeah. He, he stood there like a, um, a wooden person and would invite various people, like the Beatles, to come. And they were all supposed to do various nice things so that they didn't upset anyone out in TV land. And you would think that someone dressed like a, an Amanita Muscaria would be perfect in that role. Anyway, here she was in the middle of nowhere. Kamchatka is nowhere. There's nothing there. There are bears, there's salmon, there are some Russians in Petropavlovsk, and there are these Koryak and Chukchi people who are living in the north. And they are um, ethnic minorities. They have nothing in common with the Russians. The Russians pick mushrooms. The Koryaks pick muscaria. They don't care about the other mushrooms. All of the things we saw it told us that she was not an isolated phenomenon, although she was a shape-shifting shaman as it were, and here she is shamanizing. Um, she was able to um, have her gear hidden in various places behind bushes, and she would come out dressed like a hunter, and she would drop down behind a bush and come out dressed as a deer, and she'd run around, and she told us she was 72 years old at this time, and she had more energy than anyone in our group had. She was jumping and leaping like a deer, and then she would drop down in the bushes and come out as a hunter, hunting that deer. And she was doing all this, and we said, um, are you on Amnita Muscaria? Have you, are you taking it now? And she absolutely straight faced said, I've never taken this mushroom. <laughs> and I was like, okay, <laughs> anything you say. But she was also the person who basically um, collected this mushroom and used it in her practice because she was a healer. This is the mushroom in Kamchatka, and this is the mushroom in Telluride. It is different, and the ones here do have different side effects, which is why I'm not encouraging you all to run out and gather as much as you can and um, consume it, because there are side effects that are not so pleasant. On the other hand, there are people now who are cooking this as food, and I suppose if you boil it long enough and then saute it, it is relatively safe. But as one person said already this week, that when asked to describe the experience eating Amanita muscaria here in Telluride that was cooked as an edible, she said, 
Well, it's like the drug they give you when you're going in for a colonoscopy. Okay, maybe not yet. I know many of you have had colonoscopies. When was your last one? Are you looking forward to your next one? <laughs> right, just as I thought. Okay, so the, probably the most valuable book that I've read on drugs is this book. It's Psychedelic Drugs Reconsidered. It's written by Lester Grinspoon. It came out in uh, 1979. It's a long time ago. That's over 30 years ago. And what was interesting, what's so fascinating about this book is that the chapter, in, and this is available, um, I think you can get it on Amazon. There's, a new, there's an edition available. The, the chapters on therapeutic uses of psychedelic drugs are almost the blueprint for what is being done now with magic mushrooms. All that work that's been done at Johns Hopkins is being done at NYU. All the, a lot of what was discussed at the MAPS conference in April, if you read the therapeutic uses of psychedelic drugs chapter in Psychedelic Drugs Reconsidered, you find that this is exactly what they were doing back in the late 60s and early 70s, um, trying to deal with um, the issue of recidivism. Tim, and Tim Leary had a project which didn't succeed. He went into a jail, um, um, in the, I think it was in the Boston area, and worked with inmates with the idea that by giving them large doses of LSD, he could transform them into um, good citizens who would not do things that would put them back in jail. And the, the um, project, one of the problems with Tim Leary, I think, is it was very hard for him to follow through some of his projects because he was probably so stoned most of the time that he didn't know which project was on or up or where he was. Um, but I don't want to demean him because I think he did an enormous uh, positive um, uh, op uh, op opening for a lot of us as, at the same time that he scared all the lawmakers in America because he really gave the fear of, we are after your children and we are going to get them all stoned and they are not your children anymore. And I think all the lawmakers in America stood up and said, not on our, not on our time. And they passed these horrible laws, um, placing things like magic mushrooms on the same kind of schedule as heroin. And, you know, A, magic mushrooms are not addictive, B, um, they are not life-threatening. C, to have a lethal dose, I, no one knows of such a thing. And the more you take, the stronger the reaction, but the duration is the same, because after six hours, it's over, and you don't have these flashbacks. So there are lots of things that are connected with, say, bad LSD trips that you don't really have with magic mushrooms. It's the prop, it's prop, the safest kind of psychedelic out there, I think, in terms of things you could use that could benefit you and that have the least likelihood of a downside. And we'll talk a little bit about that. But anyway, this book and that chapter is like a blueprint for what they're doing today. So that if you read about using magic mushrooms for people who are um, in terminal conditions, this was discussed in 79. They were doing these studies. They were doing the studies um, that about um, a variety of different kinds of complaints people had so that you could use those drugs then and it was working and then all of that stopped. And all you could hope for was that somehow there would be a climate change. The climate change actually occurred in Europe quite a few years ago where things had opened up so that you could go, my brother went to Amsterdam and he came back and he said, you won't believe this, they have all these mushrooms for sale in Amsterdam. And you can go into these shops and you can buy magic mushrooms, different kinds, and they ask you, what kind of trip do you want? And he's like, what? 
Do, do you want an out of space trip? Do you want a just good, friendly, you know, convivial trip? Um, do you want a really deep mystical experience? But you could buy it based on what you wanted. And we still don't have that in this country, but as soon as medical psilocybin becomes available, and I'm hoping that lawmakers like, hey, our good times here, um, will help change that law so that perhaps medical psilocybin will be available um, soon in Colorado. Yes? Right. Okay. <laughs> So this was the article that came out in the Johns Hopkins. All of these things are online. You can read every one of them. And there's quite a few, um, both articles and things like this article in Scientific American that came out, this is off my computer, um, that was reviewing the response a year, 18 months later, checking with those people. Well, how did it go? You know, and finding out that it had legs that it wasn't sort of a trip, and then you went back into your old life, but that this was life-changing. So what Katrina was talking about this morning, about every day you should eat a wild food, a, some wild plant, this can be life-changing. It means that you totally reorient your whole life, and you can do this consciously, and you can do it without drugs, and you can just like get into a different mindset and you can do this with wild plants. Well, you can also do this with magic mushrooms. And since this is a mushroom festival, we tend to emphasize the use of mushrooms, but it can be done in any number of different ways. And I mentioned that there are these things, I hope you're gonna read them, they're online, they're great to read um, and they're easily available. And the, the maps, if you haven't used this website, it's wonderful because it's got lots of articles on it. It's got some, Andy Weil gave a talk at the maps conference and all 55 minutes of it are available online on this um, website. So you could hear what Andy said back in April at the, um, at the conference. And they're going to be putting other videos on of uh, other speakers. It's something we've never really done here in Telluride, but maybe as we're reaching into this new technology of uh, the 21st century, we can begin to do this. Uh, because there's an awful lot of people who spoke here in Telluride, we have audio tapes of them. We don't know where those tapes are, and there's no way if those tapes have like aged or been damaged that they're lost. But I don't even know who has them. Aha! So they are available. Okay, they are really historic and valuable, and I hope they will be used somehow so that we can all benefit from hearing them. Yes? Yes, okay. All right, so and this is the, the video of Andy um, at the MAPS conference this April, and you can just watch the whole thing. And if we had the time, we could even put it up on the screen here, but you can see it on your own computers. Now, another mushroom. I really like park rangers because park rangers have credentials. They walk around with badges. They have uniforms. They often have pants that have stripes down the side. Um, I mean, it's, it's close to military, but you know, they're not armed. Um, and, and, they, and they have wonderful hats. I love their hats. And they usually are there to tell you not to do something that you're doing. Like, we go to pick uh, service berries in Central Park, and we have, to, we have to hide. I mean, like, if they see us, they say, you're not supposed to pick those. Those are for the birds. And you, th and you say, you know, there are so many service berries that not all the birds in the world could eat these. And then they say, well, it's against the law. And you say, oh, OK. And then they drive away, and then you go back and pick your service berries because uh, they don't come back. But um, you're feeling that you have to sort of hide to do these things. So I try to get on the good side of these rangers, and I want to teach them how to recognize mushrooms. And I said, I'd really like to show you some of the things we have in the park that you might be interested in. And do you know what Calvin really wanted to learn? He wanted to learn how to recognize the big laughing gym. 
And we did, and this is a psychoactive mushroom in Central Park, it grows in big clusters on wood. And he took me back to the ranger station in a, um, a big old castle, and all the rangers were down in the basement of the castle, and, and they were all like eager to learn how to get stoned um, while you're on duty in Central Park. And I thought, okay. <laughs> I can do that. And, and uh, he would find all these things, and, and the other rangers, they'd come over, and he would say, yeah, can I come by? And um, i said, sure. And he'd drive by, and here would be this official Central Park ranger car pulling up in front of my house, and he'd come in with a box full of mushrooms and put them out in my, in my yard and put them out on the table, and we'd go over them, and, well, what's this, and what's this, and what's this, and what's that? And then he told me that his group was doing a mushroom display for a, uh, a school. That every, every group of rangers had in every park had to choose a subject that they were going to focus on. Some did plants, some did birds, and they made little models of them. And the rangers in Central Park chose mushrooms. <laughs> and the, mushroom, the biggest mushroom model that they made was Big Laughing Jim. And they took this into the public schools. <laughs> Okay. So, and we were finding this one year we found it all July because it was very wet and it was, looks like it's growing in grass but it was on buried wood. This is a mushroom we don't have here in Telluride. It's really large. It looks like a Cortinarius, for example. Those quartz we saw in the walks. It's about maybe, um, oh, I don't know, three to five inches across. It's unbelievably bitter so that you couldn't possibly eat this by accident unless you've been drinking alcohol and you no longer taste anything. Or as some people said, they had it so doped up with soy sauce that it just disguised the bitterness. So as an edible, it's not there. So what do you do with something like this? Well, and this is a picture of it, what I call the thousand-headed gym, because when they come up at the base of these trees, there are uh, a huge number of these little heads, only a few of which actually grow up into big mushrooms. So I sort of prune them and take out the ones I know aren't going to grow anyway. They're just as good. Um, and oh, let me get back to that. So anyway, I was, um, I was collecting these in, um, in the park, and I was walking out with an armful, and I walked right into three beefy um, policemen who um, I, th I thought, huh, this is it. This is how it ends. Um, I'm, I'm on Rikers Island tomorrow, and, um, and it's downhill all the way. But no, they just said, you know, you've got to be careful. You know what you got? And I said, um, I think so, hoping they wouldn't say, well, what do you call it? But these were police, and they knew it was a mushroom. They're nobody's fool. Um, a mushroom just covers everything. You don't ask what kind, because there's only one kind of mushroom out there. It's just like the people who never, never looked at plants, there's only one kind of plant. It's called flora. <laughs> That's what you got out there, you got flora. Or like when I walk through the park in the spring, and the tulips are out, and it's absolutely gorgeous, and I'm hearing these people on their cell phones talking about all the daffodils. <laughs> And you know, you, you want to break into their conversation and say, um, pardon me, those are not daffodils, but it's not your conversation, and it's their life. So, okay. Anyway, these have to be dried. And they have to be dried because they're so bitter. And you make crackers out of them, essentially, like dried biscuits. They're just as bitter. But then you put nice things on them, like raspberry preserves, or or strawberry, or some fruit, so that you can get the bitter down. And Andy and I and uh, uh, two emergency room physicians went out to um, experience this mushroom in what we thought was a bucolic part of Long Island. And it was, it was a beautiful place. And um, we all took this mushroom, and Bitters all get out, but I figured, here I am, surrounded by three doctors. What's the worst that can happen? Well, of course, all the doctors were taking the mushroom also. 
So we were all in the same boat, as it were. And one doctor, and we didn't realize the danger of a swimming pool, but one of the emergency room physicians sat by the pool for two hours, staring into the water. And, you know, he could have drowned, but he said that afterwards, he said that he was having such a good time watching the dolphins that it never occurred to him, it never occurred to, him to like, get in. Um, on, on a trip to the Amazon, we actually went with a reporter from the Wall Street Journal, and he got into a, um, a little dugout and went off on his own because he said, I need to be by myself. And he said, and I'm going to find the dolphins in the Amazon. And we were on the ship, the main boat, looking at him, and the dolphins were behind him. He didn't see them. And we said, don't say a word. Let's just see if he discovers them. He didn't. He came back and he was really sad. He said, I didn't see any of them. And I said, well, that's really a shame. He said, yes, because if I had, I would have jumped overboard. And we were thinking, here this article would be a front page headline, Amazon trip fatal to Wall Street um, Journal reporter. And that would have been um, the beginning and the end of my career. Mm. So anyway, so here we were out on Long Island, and here's Andy Weil with, um, hugging this tree. And he's walking around this tree, and 45 minutes go by, and all he's doing is walking around the tree. He's not letting the tree go. And he is, not, he is just walking around this tree very slowly. And afterwards, we said, well, Andy, um, what, what, what was it like? And he said, oh, it was wonderful. He said, well, what were you doing? And he says, I was just with this tree. And, okay. Um, my experience was that I, um, I, I, I mentioned this last year, that I, um, I saw these people in the distance. That is, I saw these horses in the distance. And I saw these primates um, get up, and they were standing, they were bipedal. And they got up, and they were all, they had clothes on. And they got up on top of these horses. And I realized I was seeing a moment in evolution when our species became upright and immediately put clothes on. And they looked like designer clothes. And they got right up on a horse. They domesticated animals. Just as soon as they came down from the trees and stood up and got dressed and got on horseback, and it was like in a blink of an eye. And it was a mar it stayed with me. And I know evolution goes just that way. So, and, and without the experience of a mushroom like this, how would you, how would you know? Just what you read in books. This was also the only mushroom I was ever able to um, have a rebirth experience with. And this is why I was talking last night about the Stanislav Grof book. Because under the influence of this mushroom, I did have a rebirth. And I'll tell you, it's really messy. Um, <laughs> If you are someone who is really um, sort of anal compulsive and you really like to be clean and you don't like all that stuff and you're going through it and you're thinking, hmm, maybe there is a better way. But you're already like partially through the love canal, so it's like no turning back now. And you get through and it, and it's really quite there, is, there are painful moments, you know, if your head's really large. And um, it's just difficult. But on the other hand, then you come out. And it's, it's this wonderful moment. And you're waiting to be slapped on your rear so that you can cry. And I'm waiting, and I'm waiting, and I'm waiting, and thinking, where is the slap? When is it coming? And, you know, you're under the influence. And I must have, I must have been slapped. Maybe to jolt me out of what I was in. Who knows? And it wasn't my rear that got slapped. Anyway, um, this is an experience that you can have with these mushrooms. And so you think, why would you do such things? Well, so that you can come to a festival like Telluride and you can put on a costume like this and walk down the main street and feel just like anybody else. <laughs> You won't do this, say, on Fifth Avenue in Manhattan. 
without really um, arousing comment. You think it's really difficult for people, for, for um, people of the Muslim faith who want to walk around with veils on? You want to walk around dressed up like a mushroom? Do you think you could even get a block? No way. If that isn't a danger, just looking at that, you don't know what that person has. But Homeland Security would probably be called immediately. So, and this is actually a wonderful Bolit, King Bolit costume. So, all right. So this is a, um, a little take on some magic mushrooms. Uh, some of the things that you're interested in, while there are no magic mushrooms here, growing except for that one specimen that was found years ago. Uh, many of you, or most of you, come from areas where there are magic mushrooms. If you come from Florida, or Texas, or the Carolinas, or West by God, Virginia, or Pennsylvania, or New York, or California, or Oregon, or Washington, these places are rampant in, at times with magic mushrooms. It's hard not to find them. Um, in New York City, I never saw magic mushrooms until I was out in November. I don't look for mushrooms in November. It's after the season. But these mushrooms come up in November, and they come up in wood chip mulch. And these, most of the mushrooms we find are from wood chip mulch brought in from places like California. So we have lots of psilocybe cyanescens now coming up on the grounds of the botanical garden. And I've taken, um, I've taken people there, even though the people at the garden would like me not to do this, um, to show people where they're growing. Because they say, it's, this is for science. We are studying it. You don't use it. I said, right. And, um, <laughs> but most of the people who work at the botanical garden like the perks that are available there because there are a lot of plants and mushrooms that those people benefit because they get paid so little. So they benefit from all the plants and mushrooms that are available and they want to know every one of them, especially things that they can enjoy. And magic mushrooms are in that category. So I hope you enjoyed this talk. I think that there are questions you probably have and certainly, if you saw the, the movie, Know Your Mushrooms, you might like to talk about it tonight when we have this uh, seminar. Uh, it's going to be, I think, 8.30 or something this evening. Yep. And, and it's going to be a free-ranging exploration of, of magic mushrooms and entheogens in general in terms of mind medicine. So that's a pretty broad category. And we're going to have, we're going to try to have it as open to the audience participation as possible. So think about what you would like to ask about mushrooms in particular. Like, what's a, what's a minimal dose? What's a, an active dose? What's a really high dose? How many can you take? How many days between doses? How often should you take them? You heard Paul saying he only takes them now once every couple years. Um, we know Jonathan Ott needs to take them every six months. Some of us take them much more frequently because we need that reemergence. Um, some of us can recall experiences almost completely from years ago and get ourselves into the state we were in, which is wonderful so that you can re you retain deep memory of these experiences. I mean, I can be out near Andromeda in about five seconds, starting now. <laughs> no, 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 <laughs> afterwards. Um, but it's, it's one of those things that you can really, uh, uh, you have the ability to do. So anything, as Andy Weil would say, anything is possible and the only thing we really have to fear, as FDR said, is fear itself. And the only thing that holds us back from being all that we can be is this fear of letting go and, letting, and actually discovering the powers we have in ourselves 
to explore and to experience because we are what there is out there and we are part of it all but we have an amazing amount of ourselves that we have never explored. And some of you are psychonauts who have explored more than others. Some of you are great travelers who have traveled the planet. But I think we all have something we can share together. And I think a lot of us, whether we're on the first step or we're up at the top, we have a lot to learn from each other, whether it's about mushrooms, about entheogens, about what we can do when we leave here, how we can spend this next year before next year's Telluride Festival. So I hope you will come back next year and tell us what your year was like and what experiences you had, what entheogenic experiences you've had, and share that with us. So thank you very much, and I'll see you um, on the walk and the book signing and the seat. Just a couple little announcements. The four A's are going to be meeting outside, and so uh, you want to go. There's uh, Katrina Blair has a wild crafting uh, four A. There's going to be John Sir Jesse and a lot of folks. Gary, uh, go outside and get in your groups. I'm also proud to say that uh, Eleanor uh, Chavez has given uh, Natasha Lewin from High Times, who's here, uh, her spot on the 